Well, I guess that means we're on, right? Let's do it. Let's do it. Well, Jeremy, thanks for co-hosting with me. I'm super excited to be part of this dynamic duo. It's giving me Wonder Twin vibes and I love it. But let's go ahead and get started and introduce our next guest. And our next guest is John Lair, co-founder and general partner at Workbench. And for those of you who do not know what Workbench is, there's no shame here. We're not shaming. But Workbench is an enterprise technology-focused venture capital firm in New York City. And they're really focused in partnering to build the next Fortune 500 go-to market strategies. So let's go ahead and let's have John join us. Oh, but you know what? Before John joins us, since we're talking about Workbench, I want to tell a little funny story about when I went to Google Workbench. So I Googled Workbench and then I Googled John's name and I got some really interesting hits from my Google search. And I just want to tell everybody who's listening who might be interested in an actual Workbench for your, you know, your home studio, they're on sale. I think it has something to do with Memorial Day, but my Google search rendered a lot of very interesting sales for workbenches. So for those of you in the world and in the wild who this is something of interest to you, I highly recommend you do that Google search for both workbench and for a workbench. Perfect. No one Let's have a chat. That yeah. Awesome. Well, John's here. John, I was just telling the story of my Google search for workbench and how I came upon some really great deals just in time for Memorial Day. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. Just getting past a few technical hiccups, but I think we are good to go. Awesome. Well, before you get started and just blow us away, I know that you are not only a VC, but you are a basketball fan and a basketball player. A little birdie told me, and that birdie is your website, that you've been with the same men's basketball league and the same team for 12 plus years. Is this true? That is true. We had played together on the Upper East Side in New York City. Great group of guys. And unfortunately, because of COVID, it obviously put an end to it the past year, but I'm really hoping as things open back up later this year, we'll get back together because it's a great tradition we have. But that's so cool. So with that in mind, which team would you buy into and why? Which team in like in the NBA? NBA, WNBA. I don't know if you're watching like, you know, and one street ball, whatever. <laughs> that's a good throwback. So I'm actually from Miami originally, so it would have to be the Miami Heat. I'm a diehard fan. Okay. All right. I will, that answer is approved. So with that, I'll let you go ahead and get started. Cool. And I'm going to assume everyone can see my slides as I'm navigating these fun tech difficulties. Cool. Uh, Hey everyone. So it is a pleasure to be here. My name is John Lair and I'm co-founder and general partner of Workbench. For anyone unfamiliar with us, we're an enterprise VC based in New York City, and our sweet spot is investing in startups with a live product and turbocharging their go-to-market. This typically corresponds to leading three to $6 million investment rounds. And before Workbench, I worked at Morgan Stanley in the office of the CIO and IT, where my team would meet hundreds of startups a year, and we actually helped onboard many of them as vendors. At Workbench, we believe that great things happen at the intersection of suits and hoodies. And for the past seven years, we have hosted over 1,500 events from our monthly New York Enterprise Tech Meetup to developer lunches to our go-to-market summit and lots more. We love investing in Giphy. And for almost every company on this slide, we actually invested pre-revenue based on the promise of their product solving a huge and timely market need. In today's talk, I'm going to speak at New York Speed and cover a bunch of go-to-market related topics based on the promise of their product solving a, on, cover a bunch of go-to-market related topics important for all the cloud native startups in this audience. So in starting with product, the first question you have to ask yourself is if you're building in the realm of Giphy, do you need a tech innovation? What I mean by this is there are things that Google has that other enterprises don't. In the case of Cockroach Labs, as an example, they're based on Google Spanner, which leverages atomic clocks for external consistency. Now, unlike Google, 
Startups don't have atomic clocks. But a key to Cockroach's value prop is consistent data at global scale. So to enable this functionality, they built multi-raft, as pictured on the right, on top of the raft consensus algorithm. Now, the second tip is really developer experience. Unlike Google, which dictates what product its employees will use, when you're building a Giphy startup, you need to build something that people actually care about and want to use. Developer experience is critical. And in the case of AuthZ, which is inspired by Google Zanzibar, they're building an array of integrations and cleaner APIs to make using their authorization service enticing. Now we're gonna switch gears and talk sales tactics shortly, but building a sandbox is a great product enhancement that can enable your customer prospects to see your product in action before any salesperson reaches out. Too many startups are desperate to demo their technology for the tech's sake, and that's actually wrong. Demos should be about solving your customer's problems. And if users can play in the sandbox in advance, it can hopefully make the sales pitch all the more effective and targeted to their actual needs. The last product tip is critical when you're ready to sell into the Forge 500. Forge 500 companies at large tend to have robust needs across security and scalability. CoreOS went after the enterprise from day one and built capabilities such as self-driving Kubernetes, which enabled the shift away from VMs in a safe, compliant manner for the biggest of institutions. All right, so let's switch gears now and talk community. Cockroach's chief product officer, Nate Stewart, stressed in a recent conference talk about building community that while the holy grail is self-service, it takes substantial investment to get there for your community. They've invested in documentation to get there and also enabled self-learning through Cockroach University and have seen great success with both initiatives. Customer conferences in a company's early days are so hard to pull off. But if you can do it and do it right, it's truly a force multiplier for your brand, market positioning, and sales pipeline. This is where a great early VC partner can play an outsized role. And for CoreOS in 2015, we brought them senior infrastructure executives from Goldman Sachs and Bank of America IT to talk about container adoption and financial services. This naturally then led to talk about orchestration and led to some benefits of CoreOS feeding into the conversation rather organically. Another form of community is your customers and your prospects. Cockroach Labs has held client advisory board meetings over the years, and it's been an opportunity for them to share their roadmap and new use cases. And importantly for the attendees, it's a chance to learn from peers, advance their careers, and feel a sense of ownership in the company and its product roadmap. Consistent efforts build trust. And eventually you can earn nice wins like this JP Morgan Award that Cockroach received in November for their innovation and partnership. All right, this is a part that I know a lot of people were waiting for, digging into the tactics of sales. We had Twilio's founder and CEO, Jeff Lawson, speak at our New York Enterprise Tech Meetup in March, and he shared an interesting nugget with us. Twilio only had 12 people at the time of their 2016 IPO. Let that settle in a second. 12 for a company that went public for billions of dollars. Now, Twilio has been an incredible success, but Jeff made an interesting comment. He regrets that he didn't hire more salespeople earlier because his ARR would have scaled even faster. This concept of developer first, but not developer only sales is an important issue. Especially right now, while product-led growth is extremely popular, sales teams are still needed to close large enterprise opportunities. Depending on what you're building, it may make more sense to land early adopters in tech first or to go after a sophisticated Wall Street bank first. It may be surprising to you, but even if you go after tech companies first in your sales motion, you're gonna need to be SOC 2 certified sooner than you think in order to close large customer contracts. We have a playbook guide on our website that walks through the entire process. If you may be scratching your head as like, what is a SOC 2? Or if it kind of gives you a nervous sweat, don't worry, 
It's just a compliance process. It's kind of annoying and manual, but with the right guide, you can actually do fine with it. Now, this slide actually has a ton of meat on it. So I'm gonna rapid fire some key takeaways for you all. First and foremost, do not hire a VP sales too soon. This may seem self-explanatory, but the key rationale behind this is that as a founder, you need to close your early customers. They'll be making a bet on you based on you evangelizing your product and the broader vision you lay out. And you'll also learn a ton from those early conversations. Second, you need to confirm that do nothing is off the table. I can't tell you how many times I've heard of startups having successful POCs, they demonstrate that their tech did what they promised, only to then hear back, oh, sorry, deal never materializes. You need someone who doesn't just have budget, but you, have someone, you need to have someone that can actually spend the budget. Be open with your prospects and ask why they wanna buy your product this quarter. Equally importantly, ask why would they not? It may seem a little bit scary to do, but by being open in that dialogue, you can actually learn a lot and understand if you have a true champion inside a big organization. Now, this next tip is the pufferfish strategy. I love the name of this one. This has you acting bigger than you are, even when early customers try to use your small size against you to negotiate a cheaper deal. The trick here is trading the discount for something that's gonna help you grow bigger. This could be logo usage on your website. It could be reference calls, an upfront payment to help with cash flow, and lots of other ideas. So certainly get creative here. They're always gonna want that cheaper discount, but if you can leverage it for something else, you'll be well positioned. Now, when thinking about Greenfield versus Brownfield, especially in the world of cloud native, what we found is that Greenfield gets you quicker, earlier wins to establish yourself in a customer. Once that beachhead is firmly planted, then you can begin working on the larger, but often trickier brownfield opportunities that have multiple stakeholders involved and tend to be much longer drawn out sales processes. When working on your early messaging, make sure that you take copious notes from every customer conversation. You really need to listen closely. What did you think would resonate that didn't? What excited your prospects and kept them talking? Compile these notes over dozens of conversations and be sure to update your messaging and pitch accordingly. Last section I'm gonna cover is buyer personas. Now I have this conversation all the time and many people, especially in the world of Giphy, tend to be surprised that Wall Street tends to be the earliest and largest adopter of enterprise technology with healthcare and media industries right behind them. Now, this isn't because they're dying to work with startups, it's because they have large budgets, sophisticated IT orgs, and they need to keep evolving due to, to competitive pressures. So tech is seen as an enabler of these business needs. Avoid industries like retail or manufacturing because they don't have real budgets. They're very slow to evaluate new tech. And even if you do end up in a successful POC, you often get back to my last, uh, my point from the last slide that a lot of times they actually can't spend the budget or they can't implement the tech. So really be careful in those industries. The other thing to be wary of is uh, really what sequencing you're targeting. Within your specific domain, you need to know what categories get bought before yours so you can pitch your prospects at the appropriate time. They may be having a whole cloud transition in the works, but if you're working on some subcomponent that's not going to be relevant until 12, 24 months from now, they may be interested in learning from you and extracting those insights, but there may not actually be a sales opportunity. So really make sure that you're aware of the sequencing and where they are on their journey. In terms of roles to target, it's like Goldilocks and the three bears. A lot of people think, oh, if I only get that CIO meeting, I'm gonna be golden because they'll force things down. Guess what? They're too senior. They're not involved in the day-to-day -day tactics. They're not gonna help you at all. And it's gonna waste your time because they're so tough to get on the calendars of, only to learn that they're not gonna be relevant. Now, the flip side is, in a world of bottoms up, people may think, hey, individual developers can actually help me and build up that groundswell. While it is critical to get a base of evangelists within a potential customer, and certainly happy developers can help make the case, them alone, they tend to be too junior 
in the rank to actually spend budget dollars. One other tidbit is avoid innovation teams. 95% of the time, they're gonna waste your resources and not be connected to a true business or IT initiative with real heft and budget behind them. The just right fit is what we call middle out go to market. This involves finding a mid-level executive who feels the pain you're solving and takes it upon themselves to solve the problem with your product. They're incentivized to make a name for themselves in their org if things work out, and therefore a mutual trusted relationship can end up key here to helping you have huge success. So that is a wrap on my rapid fire tips for Giphy Go to Market. We love nerding out on this all day, every day at Workbench. We host hundreds of events here. We publish tons of content on our blog. You can see links to sign up below. And I'm not sure if we have time for questions, but happy to answer if we do. Thank you so much, everybody. Excellent. Thanks. So, thanks so much for that. The uh, I think the first question was in the form was not quite a question, but uh, was uh, Jason's uh, wish project sold themselves and like, yeah, if you build it, they will come doesn't, doesn't <laughs> seem to quite work. But um, any uh, any further tips for um, getting like uh, before you have salespeople or before you have enough salespeople? Yeah, so it's actually incumbent really on the founder or the co-founders together to meet with as many people as they can and really learn. It's not even just about closing that initial contract, but the most important part is even what's the use case? Where is the pain that people will allocate budget? And before you get the salespeople, just see if you can get enough people to commit using the product and then eventually you can get a little bit of money charged. But in the early days, I've seen people think that you need big contracts to start. From a venture capitalist perspective, if you can show that you've got happy users, they're coming back using it repeatedly, and that you can start getting people to open up their checkbooks, that's a great way to start showing that the flywheel is in motion and going. Uh, you had mentioned that there are a few verticals that were best to focus on. Could you, uh, could you reiterate those? For sure. So financial services, that could be Wall Street banks and large insurance companies, uh, media, and healthcare pharmaceutical world they tend to have huge budgets that have to get spent. They tend to be surprisingly forward thinking. I mean, I've spoken to, I, as I mentioned, I was an IT guy at Morgan Stanley. So I've spoken to so many people that were bankers there and they're like, we bought technology, we worked with startups. And I mean, we met hundreds of startups a year and we're early adopters for so many companies. I was there back 20, a decade ago. So the beginnings of big data, right? There was early innings of cloud. I can't tell you how many companies we actually onboarded for the right use case internally. And we, you know, those were huge contracts for the companies that we ended up doing business with. It makes sense that there'd be a heavy focus on the core business as opposed to the, um, the attraction to continue to build it yourself or, or work on yeah. something shiny. Yeah, excellent. I think we will uh, uh, let you go with our, uh, with our deep thanks and, uh, and appreciation and continue the, uh, continue the role of the show. Thanks so much for joining yeah. us. Grace, and you're, and you're back. Perfect. I was going to take the, uh, the brief moment between to uh, let folks know that uh, Bill and Ted style, we do have a code of, contact, code of conduct. In addition to be excellent to each other, uh, you can find its entirety linked at the bottom of the website. That's metal.equinix.com. Uh, all of your comments come in through whatever venue you're watching, if that's on uh, Twitter, if that's on uh, Facebook, not on Facebook. If that's on Twitch, if that's on, uh, if that's on YouTube, uh, we see those and can respond. If you want deeper discussion, uh, you can hop over to slack.equinix.metal.com, the community Slack. And uh, there are many of us in there having uh, chats about the uh, talks that are going on now.